This is a topic that a lot of colleges and universities are increasingly concerned with and thinking about. And so we have on our panel um, Teresa Castor from UW Parkside, Cynthia Simon from University of New England, and Katie Dunn from the University of Michigan. And I'm going to go ahead and pose a few questions to our panelists, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so the first question is if you could briefly introduce yourself, your institutional affiliation, and just some details about the internship course that you have developed or overseen. With regards to how we have structured the course for credit for internships, it is a course within our department, Communication 494. It is treated like a course would be treated in our department. In other words, the person who is teaching it, um, it is part of their load, or if it's during the summertime, then the individual is compensated for it as if they were teach at for just like any other course in our program would, would be compensated. Um, let's see. Within our department, we have approximately 120 students, and each year, roughly 30, 40 students complete internships. So that's anywhere between 8 to 15, or um, sometimes 20 students per term who does the internship. And with regards to how it's structured, um, the best way for me to explain it is that as a course, it has a syllabus. So there are learning goals for the course. There's a schedule in terms of assignments that students turn in on a regular basis. Um, at the start of the semester, the students will develop a learning agreement that, uh, that articulates the tasks and responsibilities of the internship. And that's an agreement that's developed between the student and the internship professional supervisor. In addition, the student in the learning agreement will identify um, two to three department learning goals that from our communication program that they'll focus on. And in the reflection assignments that they turn in on a regular basis throughout the semester, they will reflect on those learning goals. And just to give you an example, some of the learning goals relate to issues like identity, diversity, messages, um, knowledge, research, and roles. And so, for example, our public a student doing a public relations internship might reflect on the kind of messages that they created um, for their, their um, internship um, as part of their internship. Um, it is currently being taught as an online course and one of the advantages of that is that there are regular discussion board posts and basically the students will have the advantage of not just learning from their own internship but hearing from their peers about their learning experiences. Um, in addition, there are assessments, midterm evaluations from the semester as well as end of the semester evaluations from site supervisors. Um, and then for the end of the semester in terms of assessment, there's a final paper that the student will submit as well as a final portfolio. So that's the basic structure of our internship course. And the students go through the, the, um, the course schedule pretty much um, in, I guess, in line with each other. And there are moments of um, supervi faculty supervisor and student contact as well as peer-to-peer -peer contact throughout that process. We were historically a graduate professional school, and so when our master's program was first created, a strong component for practical experience and engagement was part of that, um, and an internship requirement was part of the degree. Uh, since then, that has expanded to a second master's program that we launched. Um, and several years ago, we launched a brand new undergraduate degree program, which includes an optional credit-based internship as well. Um, so in the Career Development Office, we manage the internship program that is designed with uh, specific criteria or guidelines um, to meet the needs of these three degree programs, but there's a lot of flexibility in that. Uh, within the information discipline, we have students that are pursuing many different career paths. So everything from librarianship and archivists um, to data science uh, to consulting and then user experience research and design. Uh, and so we have placed a lot of the emphasis in our program on the student creating their learning objectives and um, in order to get permission to enroll in our internship course, they must submit an internship proposal. We use Simplicity as our uh, job and internship posting database, and so we also utilize that with their experiential learning component uh, for students to create the proposal. And this is really where they need to be able to articulate how the internship experience builds upon the courses they've taken at the School of Information and how it directly relates to their career goals as well. Um, and then they also create three learning objectives for themselves that 
our team approves or gives feedback kind of on whether or not the learning objective is fleshed out. Um, and then once we've approved that for permission for them to enroll in the course, uh, their supervisor is also triggered to review that information as well so that everyone's kind of on the same page from the beginning to know what the student is hoping to gain from the experience, what their expectations are, what they think their role will be so that that can be addressed early on if it's not correct, right? Um, and then once students are in the course, uh, you know, a lot of it is reflective based and so there are several reflections students must submit throughout the, the semester. The vast majority of our students are doing these credit-based internships over the summer. And so our team is typically uh, managing about 400 students and reviewing those proposals and then working with them through our courses at the graduate and undergraduate level. Um, but we use the same curriculum across both all of the degree programs uh, since it is more learner directed um, for them to reflect on their experience. Um, but this past summer, we did incorporate Switzer and King's uh, developmental stages of an internship as a way to give students kind of a framework of what to expect when they're starting their internship and then the different stages they might encounter. Um, but then also strategies for how to face each of those stages. And a lot of the reflective prompts are based on where are you, what are you learning from this, how are you handling that. Uh, we also have it all online so that it's discussion based with peers. Um, students self-select into the groups that they'd like to be in based on kind of around common career paths that our students pursue um, so that they're finding some of that commonality with the industries or roles that they have. Um, at the end of the semester, students and employers do submit evaluations about the experience, and students submit an internship learning portfolio through uh, the Portfolio platform, where they're able to really demonstrate and document what they learned from the experience and include artifacts of what they were able to accomplish. And listening to my colleagues up here on the panel, it's really exciting to have you hear about th three very unique styles of internship programming. One within a department where our faculty are teaching the internship course based on their discipline, and then the second model through career services, and then my model is a, a different one. Um, it's a hybrid, hybridized central model internship program for the entire college. So in other words, um, I wear two hats. I'm the director of internships for the College of Arts and Sciences, so I run the programming and administration which includes everything from the employers to uh, campus community relations, um, working with faculty and staff, um, as well as teaching the internship curriculum to students. Um, in the folder that you got, you'll see a handout um, that lists the internship courses that we have in our program. And on one side is the internships that are taught by department faculty. And on the other side, the longer list, are the internships um, taught by me. So it shows where I'm using not um, a department discipline, but the internship discipline to teach the internship curriculum. So I'll explain that further. Um, so a little bit more about the overall. The um, process that I use for programming includes having students come into a group session so that I have face-to-face -face contact with the students in groups across the majors. It's a brief session followed by one-on-ones with students based on their needs in helping them prepare for internships. I then refer students to career services for professional soft skills and development and preparation and other needs as well as first-year experience staff and professional advisors and then faculty advisors as needed. So it's more of a team approach in the beginning, in the semester prior. Um, and then what happens is the students then work with us one-on-one -on -one until they have their internship secured. And then the semester starts and the student is out at their internship site. And at that point, I'm using one syllabus for the entire college. I have one syllabus for every major. And that may not up front seem, imp uh, seem possible, but it very much is um, because the internship syllabus is designed to reflect the internship as a discipline itself. So all the students are submitting homework based on the idea that they're learning their, um, their skills and their knowledge about their discipline from their site supervisor at the internship site. And the assurance, quality assurance in there is that the sites are vetted 
for the learning outcomes that they're going to provide the student in the internship, internship experience so it doesn't look like a job description. They actually need to submit a learning description right up front in order for them to work with us. The students, when they do their internship proposal, also submit learning goals, and we make sure that those match what the site has to offer. Um, both I and the department chair sign off on the approval of the internship before it begins for um, multiple reasons, but primarily for the learning goals. And then the student begins the internship, they do their hours, they're submitting their homework. Um, during that semester, I'm also checking in with the supervisors twice during the semester. The students are submitting homework every two weeks so that I have contact with each of them every two weeks. And then at the end, there are evaluations from the students and the supervisors. And many of the, probably most of the questions that I ask are identical. What the student asks is uh, answers and what the supervisor answers are the same question. Um, one example I'll give is I'll ask the student, did you get a job offer at the end of this internship directly from your site placement? And then I'll ask the supervisor, did you offer this student a job? And I've found actually that they disagree. <laughs> that the supervisor says yes and the student says no or vice versa. Um, so it's interesting to do those matching. Um, and then of course for assessment, I'm doing assessment for the college, but I give assessment results to departments so that they too can do department assessment. So hopefully something in there is useful for you. And one of the things that we're hoping to do on our center's website is to post um, a catalog or a little library of examples of course syllabi. Um, hopefully we'll be able to post yours if they're publicly available. Um, but I've amassed about 30 of them and they're, they're remarkable in their variation. Um, there's very few that look almost exactly alike and I think you just heard that here. So I'll pose a couple questions and then we could open it up to the floor. Um, the first is what would be your advice for colleagues who are just starting out on this process of developing an internship course? I get regular questions from people within departments or colleges saying we're thinking about it but we don't know where to start. So what would you say to those colleagues? So in starting an internship for credit course, um, before you begin, I think the first thing that I would say is not actually curriculum related, but more administrative related, which is to look at the resources available to you and to make sure the resources are in place because it's, it's nobody's fault, but what's gonna happen is it can grow and grow and grow and grow, and over time it does grow, and the internship isn't like other curriculum. The internship involves students and the school and employers and community partners and it's the latest buzzword it's hot and being hot everybody wants a piece of it in one way or another and so it becomes quite a burden so to have budget in place staffing in place technology in place and so forth would be something i'd say to to look at before beginning an internship for credit and then my second piece of advice would be registration um, registration issues with four credit internships are huge. Uh, the timing of when the semester or term runs is rarely compatible to community organizations and employers' needs. Um, deadlines for registration, the tuition involved, students' course loads, etc. And so it, it might be to consider it an option instead of necessarily a requirement and to, to not have internships be the end all of your experiential programming. I would really echo everything um, that Cynthia just shared and I think it was interesting for me I somewhat inherited our graduate level internship course um, but it, the curriculum had been developed at a time where our enrollment typically maxed out at about 130 students and so looking at the scalability of something is important um, because that's a lot of what I've been working on the past several years. Um, I've been at the School of Information for six years and our student population has doubled in that time and so it was really important for me to actually take a step back and think about what does this process look like on the employer side, what does the process look like on the student side and then on our staff side as well um, to really streamline things and make it work. Uh, so I am a staff member but I'm, I also have ad, um, adjunct lecturers status and so that's just on top of my staff role and so wearing many different hats at the School of Information it was important to be able to streamline that 
Um, and we started to get some employer pushback as well on some of the pieces we had originally asked them to do in the process, um, where originally the employers were really submitting the proposal to hire an intern. Um, and their HR departments got wind of that and said, no, <laughs> we're not going to let them do that anymore. Um, and so, you know, that kind of forced us to re-envision what that looked like as well. Um, a couple of years ago, we were able to successfully propose a required course for our incoming juniors um, where it's a career-based course. And it's really to help level the playing field for all of our incoming juniors to understand the different career paths that are available to them and really understand how to do a successful uh, internship search. And Part of what made that process successful and being able to propose a brand new course was uh, we looked to Cotter's change model um, and really being able to develop advocates in our faculty community um, that would help champion that when we went to the curriculum committee and said, here's what we would like to do and why. Um, and the first time we proposed it, we didn't do that. And we were rejected, and, and that was fine. But when we went back to the drawing board and realized you know, we need to do a better job of really having those advocates on our side so that we can have this course approved. Um, and when we did that, we were successful. And so for several years now, we've had that course as a requirement for our incoming juniors, which has been changing the outcomes we're seeing for internships and jobs. So that was a big win for our team. Um, although not an internship course itself. The importance of, I would call it pre-advising for internships is very important. So within one of the advantages of having the internship course within the department is the individual who's teaching it as the instructor does a lot of work with the students um, a semester or two before they do an internship to help prepare them. And simple discussions such as helping to identify for students what are um, internship options for you because a lot of our students don't really know what they can do with the communication degree and so that's part of the advising that work that's done um, with the person who's instructing the course as well as across our, our de department so in terms of thinking about the course I would say don't think of it as just um, you are working with the course as it is happening but there is preparation work on the part of the instructor as well as the student before um, getting to the point of having the course and second, what I would emphasize is that the internship course is an academically rich learning experience. And as internships, as experiential learning opportunities, it's very important to have reflection to be a part of that. And one of the conversations going on um, in, across our campus as we are uh, de developing our community-based learning and internship practices and other high-impact practices is talking about what is reflection? How can we help students to deepen their understanding of, uh, of what they're learning from internships and these other opportunities through having appropriate question prompts for reflection? So that's the other thing I would think of or encourage you to think about is how can you make the internship course itself a learning experience by having students reflect on what they're learning and connect it to the program academic learning goals. And I, I do want to, um, I guess, since you'd mentioned the career course, I do want to add that within my department, um, I think it's almost a decade ago, I'm losing track of time, we developed something called a communication sophomore seminar class as a way of helping to introduce students to our department learning goals, as well as careers in communication, and to develop professional um, I guess to, to do more professional development work to apply for internships. So we talk about resume writing, cover letters, and also what kind of internships opportunities are, about, are available out there. So we're doing a lot of scaffolding work ahead of time to help them get to the point of taking the internship class. It came about that many of the employers on the panel were unaware of some of the academic requirements that colleges and universities have. Um, such as doing site visits. Um, the employers that were on our panel were not aware that that's a, or a requirement in some uh, campuses. Can you speak a little bit about the degree to which you involve employers in some of the course requirements and if you've received pushback from employers for either asking too much or if it hasn't been a problem at all? Um, just because there was some confusion about this issue in our last session upstairs. Several years ago, we did require more from employers up front in submitting the internship proposal and outlining the learning objectives that they saw for the internship position. Um, and we started to get a lot of pushback from employers on that. And so we flipped it. And so now 
it's student driven, but then we do send an email to the employers for them to review the information and agree that everything kind of looks like what they had discussed with the student. Um, and then I typically do one outreach email to make sure everything's going okay. We don't do site visits, uh, very rarely we would, I would go and visit um, an internship site. And then we have the evaluation from the supervisor at the end. And so I feel like we kind of went from having employers do a lot of the work up front to now not being as, as involved in some of that. Um, we send some recommendations, but I know sometimes it doesn't actually happen. And so what we've tried to do is really coach our students on how to make the most of the experience and really how to approach um, asking for regular meetings with their supervisor and making sure they have access to them for some mentorship and feedback and guidance and then also asking for an exit interview to get a lot of feedback at the end um, because we were hearing from students that some of those things weren't happening at the culmination of their internship. So I feel like we've taken the approach of really trying to help the student advocate for themselves and coach them on how to do that as part of the internship course. Um, but I do have a, a goal of kind of creating some more resources and tools for our internship supervisors uh, of things to look to that might help in making sure they are providing a successful internship experience for the students as well. The way that we've formulated it in our program is that the, when the supervisors submit a job description, we request that they submit it instead of the student will do is the student will learn how to do. And so what we have our employers do is basically sign as part of that agreement that they'll provide an orientation to the site and staff, to the environment and staff, um, that they'll provide training for the student to do well in their position, that they'll mentor the student, be available for mentoring throughout the full semester. That doesn't mean micromanaging or anything like that, but availability, um, and that they will be receptive to two check-ins during the semester. We don't require a site visit, we encourage one, um, and there's more site visits out there than I'm able to do anyway, so that's, that's not an issue. And uh, we're rural, so that works for us. Um, and then at the end, there's the evaluation. And so it's really from the community partners and employers perspective, they're signing something, they get a student for a bunch of hours, and then they do an eval at the end with a couple check-ins that are framed around helping that community partner, um, getting feedback th from them about what we can do better and, and what their needs are. So it really is framed to benefit them, um, but again with an emphasis on the student's learning. If the internship is paid, then they might also say, here's the product or services rendered from the student. But that, again, becomes in our realm of credit-bearing internship, that becomes a job of some sort, seasonal, part-time, full-time, what have you. Real quickly, if I could just add one thing. We do not have any type of formal agreements with employers. Um, that would require a lot of work with our Office of General Counsel. Um, <laughs> and so we do not have um, that level of requirement of our employers and a lot of times it's because of uh, recommendations from General Counsel on why we don't do that. Okay, um, I, I, let's, just to add, um, let's see. the internships that we promote are advertised through a system that we call, call Handshake. So those internships are, are vetted to make sure that they are um, appropriate internships and that the student wouldn't be an intern in um, coffee making or something like that all day. Um, at the st I mentioned at the start of the term there's a learning agreement that's developed and so the student is expected to have a meeting with the site supervisor to make sure that they're on the same page regarding um, what the internship is supposed to do and our uh, internship student is supposed to do and the site supervisor as well as the internship are supposed to sign off on that. So in a way that works as functions as a type of agreement between um, the internship student and the internship supervisor. In addition, there's a mid-semester evaluation as well as the, an end of the semester evaluation. And I'll, I'll also add that one, one project that our campus is working on with internships is try to trying to scale up with that. So that's part of my role as faculty director of internships and our, our department internship supervisors also working as our campus-wide internship specialist now. So um, as a campus, we have agreed to a 
campus-wide definition on internships that our Senate has approved. And we're also, we, um, we have a subcommittee related to internships that's agreed on best practices. So I just want to share that in terms of, um, that's I guess an additional way that we are trying to have some more commonality across campus regarding expectations for, for internships. Uh, at our university, we've got internships that go from one hour to nine hours a semester. So what is, what's your policy or pers how, you, how do you view that? And the second thing, you talked about this proposal. Could you maybe explain a little bit more what that means to you? Um, is, it, is the internship project based or is the, or is the you know, how does, what does that proposal look like? At our institution, credit is based on number of hours worked and so 60 hours is equal to one credit. I do not know how that formula was created, <laughs> um, but that was what was agreed upon years ago. Uh, and so for our master's students, they are required to earn six credits to graduate. And so that's 360 hours of work. It can be one full-time internship or split over several semesters. Um, for our undergrads, we only offer a three credit option. Um, that would be an elective, and that would be a minimum of 180 hours worked. Um, I think sometimes it's hard because students feel like I'm just getting the credit from doing that number of hours of work where we're trying to push, no, you're getting the credit from also doing the class and reflecting and showing that you're learning from the experience. Um, so that's been interesting. But uh, then thinking about our proposal, um, so it is an online form in our Simplicity system where they're able to tell us the employer, who their supervisor is, uh, how many hours approximately they'll be working, start date, end date, so that it helps us determine number of credits. Um, but then they also have to describe specifically uh, how the, like a description of the position, so it's not necessarily project-based. This it really is more of like a, a general internship description, um, but then they need to be able to clearly connect it to specific courses they've taken. Um, and how it will build upon that in the skills or the, the methods, the theories they've learned in those courses that they'll be able to apply through the internship experience, as well as how it directly connects to their career goals with specific instances of how it will help prepare for those goals. Um, and then this is also where they start to draft their three learning objectives with that proposal. I, I just want to add that for, for us in terms of determining the number of credits, it is also based um, on the number of hours expected that, it, that, that the internship student will be working. And that was based on thinking about for a college class, whatever the class is, how many hours is a student expected to put in for a one credit, two credit, or three credit class. So that's, that's, that's our rationale in our formula. And it's about for every, I think it's roughly every 40 to 50 hours of the course of the semester, that a student will be doing internship, that's how much the credit would be worth. I do require a minimum of three credit hours to enroll in the course, to, regardless of the department or major. Um, and so if a department wants me to be their faculty for their internship, then it, it has to be a minimum of three, and that's for the benefit of the host organization, because by the time they've trained a student, you know, in order to have repeat business, we need them, the student, to at least be able to do some performance um, in one credit hour. Um, the Department of um, Education does define hours, so it's typically 40 to 60 contact hours at their internship site per credit hour, um, but the, the Department of um, Education does, does have a statement on that. Um, and then for our proposal, mine's a little bit hefty and we're trying to reduce it because we do have legal contracts for each internship. Um, however, there's the cover sheet with all the stats and then there's the um, job description and below that the student has to define four learning goals. Um, and then there's the schedule to meet those hours. And then we have the four party signature, the student signs the organization signs, I sign, and then the chair of the department signs off. We have um, at our university several departments that have successful internship courses. One of them is Teresa's. Um, yet there are a number of departments that have small numbers of students. And so the faculty are not compensated. They're supervising them sort of off the side of their plate. And so we came up with a, a recommendation that we create we have four, four separate colleges and that we create a course similar to what you're describing that 
all the students who are not in departments where they offer an internship course could, could be come together in one course. So we thought it was a great idea. Um, but um, what we got from faculty was, oh, no, 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 you can't do that because like a chemistry internship would be very different from an, you know, um, and this isn't even in the same college, chemistry would be different than physics. Um, and so, you know, I, and I'm not, I'm not making fun, but, I, but it, like we can't get past this conversation. And so, Mike, I'm wondering, did you face that when you were designing this? Because you have more diversity in the types of disciplines than we would in one of our colleges. Um, it is a point of contention. And, you know, my, my first two thoughts on that is, one, I'm faculty. And so, you know, I wouldn't recommend having a non-faculty member create a centralized program and have that person actually manage the curriculum because curriculum belongs to faculty, and I, I defend that. So, so that's part of their defensiveness is they're always feeling like they have to defend the curriculum, and, and I agree with that. Um, second is they're defending their stipends or course releases. They're not gonna say it, maybe, but this is true. And so, um, but then on the other hand, internships are a discipline in their own right. And so, you know, I can pull that card because that's my expertise. And so I can have a conversation about the internship discipline and how the internship course follows the internship discipline and the field site teaches and mentors the student through their learning objectives. And that is, that is why internships exist. It's so we can send them out to get not just soft skills, but also knowledge and you know content knowledge about those fields. And and so, um, and then I have the chair sign off. And so those are built in. But m I'll also share that that it, I used a very bottom up grassroots approach. Um, I've been at my school for 21 years, and I was running internships ad hoc, uh, at, you know, separate on the side. Um, and then the department became three. It became marine, environmental, and pre-medical. And everybody liked what I did, and they didn't want to have to do it because it's not always, it's not what they're expert in. It's not what they want to have to do. And because I had faculty buy-in from three large, potent departments, I was able to then gain the trust of faculty in other departments that I could, in fact, teach and do assessment and answer every question. And at the very least, I told them, you'll get all the credit and I'll do all the work. And that has worked as well. So. My question is a little bit for Cynthia, but might apply to everybody else. Um, you had mentioned that you work at kind of a rural school. Um, for some background, our school has just created a brand new major that we're very excited about, but we're worried about placing those students given the size of the city of Madison, if this major is going to have 300 students and we want to have all seniors participating, that's almost 100 sites that we're going to have to cultivate. So I guess my question related to that is how, or have you ever had students who come to you saying, I can't find an internship, um, but I want to take this course, what do I do? Or for those of you who have required internships, how have you dealt with that issue of access? and? Um, have you like developed some sort of remote ability and how do you then support students who ha might have to go remote? So it's my job to get them internships. And so I just do the work, you know, what, whatever it takes. So um, I haven't had that experience where I'm gonna take on a program all of a sudden that's large in and of itself. Our, ours have all grown. Um, but as they've grown, I've been shocked at some of the growth at our school. Our school has grown. Our university's grown. Our school has grown. And some of our departments have grown. And no one realizes that my, my job has grown because of that. Um, so basically, I was able to advocate for and, and, and demonstrate that I needed help. And I, I do have one staff member now helping me. Um, so that's been really great. And they're, one of their primary duties is employer relations. But up until then, which only happened months ago, uh, basically relied on career services to help cultivate those partnerships. Faculty who obviously go to conferences and network in their fields, um, I work really closely with them. And I often will say to them, I can't take over your internship until we have some department meetings where I gain a list of sites where those students can intern and I make them prove that there's enough sites to warrant a required internship course. 
because being rural, there might not be. We found that a lot of times students develop or find internships by creating them. Um, like the, a particular site might not have an internship opening, but there is um, availability with just some creativity and thinking about it to develop an internship. So one of the things that Mary Wade, our, our campus internship um, specialists doing now is um, working with students as well as sites on how to develop internship sites. So that that's one option I would suggest to you. And this might be easier during the summertime, but we offer, um, like I think you, you offer um, our internship course online. And so what that means is a student can be anywhere and, um, be, and do an internship. So we've had students do internships in Tennessee, Florida, Italy, and while doing those internships in those sites, because they're doing the internship course online, they're able to receive credit for that. Yeah, I would just add, so although internships are required for our master's students, we do not have any type of placement agreement. We don't do any placement through our office. Um, for career education, we really want students to be able to learn how to do an internship search, and so we coach and support them through that process. Um, but we certainly see where students are, you know, at the mercy of market demands. Uh, and I would say an interesting population that's been really impacted has been our international students. Uh, we, our master's population is about 60% international, primarily from China. Um, and for those students, a lot of them come wanting to stay in the United States and do an internship and get a job here. Um, and that has changed over the past several years and how many of them are able to do it. And so we do have a lot of those tough advising and coaching conversations about parallel planning and potentially doing an internship search for US-based companies, but also doing that for Chinese-based companies as well. Um, so yeah, it can be tough, but there are lots of different options, I feel like, for students to kind of create internship opportunities or look at other opportunities. I know we talked a little about the successful internship for credit, but I'm wondering, do you guys have a definition for an unsuccessful internship? And what is that criteria? And, <laughs> um, and how does that, are you measure, what outcomes are you guys measuring for that from the student side and the employer side? I do not have a definition I do not yet have a definition for an uns that that would be a really great project. Uh, no, I don't. But I, I do have guidelines on my web page for um, you know for what's allowed and not allowed for an internship. Um, so again, you know things like providing a full orientation, um, training to training the student. The the internship mentor, in other words, the host site cannot have a student do a job that nobody in that organization can teach them how to do. They, the mentor has to be an expert in the field. So if they're not an expert in the field, they can't have one of my students, you know, because that's a, that's a co-op or that's an apprenticeship or that's a job and they should be paid. Um, which, you know, there's been so much talk today about paid versus unpaid and it's swirling my head all over the place. But I'm, my, my, my industry, my business is learning, and I, I teach a curriculum. It's for credit internships. I, I hope they're paid. I want them to be paid. I advocate for it, but it is by no means a requirement um, you know, for, for my majors. I'm thinking about our, our campus definition that we approved, and so I would just put a bunch of knots in front of the different components. <laughs> so it would not be involve a professional um, experience, it would not be connected to an academic discipline. It would not involve um, learning that connects to our university learning goals. Um, I'm looking at Deborah because I know there are some other components. So um, it would not involve reflection. So that those, I guess, so if it doesn't involve one or more of those, I, I would categorize that as a not successful internship. And with regards to um, getting input from the student or employer perspective, I mean, that's um, well, actually even that's difficult because a student could have an uh, unpleasant internship experience but still that could be a learning experience because as described earlier, they can refine some of their, their career goals. Now, a student can still realize they, that um, they weren't happy with the internship but it could still be connected to all of those things that I mentioned. It's just that they might realize that they don't want to be a, a laboratory scientist, but instead they want to do something else. Um, I'm not sure if I answered all of your questions, but those are some of my responses to at least some of them.